How did you know you wanted to be a scientist? Growing up, I always knew that I was interested in science just because uh, I think people are born nerds and certain topics appeal to them naturally. And I didn't really know what kind of science I was interested in. I knew that I liked science fiction. Um, I knew that the study of science was like the closest route to legitimate forms of magic that I was aware of. And it seems like the products of science and technology, you know, they basically are magic. If you show something that we have now to somebody 50 years ago, it, it would blow their mind, right? Like a cell phone would blow their mind. A vaccine that could be created in nine months would blow their mind. And why chemistry in particular? Why chemistry in particular was the same answer that probably a lot of people give, and that is that I had a really good teacher, uh, Mr. Dowd at uh, Hilton High School in Western New York State, and he just had a way of attributing human-like characteristics to atoms and molecules, and it appealed to me in a way that like physics and math didn't, and I think biology was a little bit too like high level, like, um, by high level, I mean too many interacting phenomena at the, at the bottom that give rise to a phenomenon that becomes a biological phenomenon, but chemistry was where it all like came together for me. And from chemistry, nanotechnology is not a very uh, far stone's throw from chemistry, in my opinion. Um, and what I ended up doing in graduate school, even though I was, I did it in chemistry, ended up looking a lot more like nanoengineering than chemistry because it was a very top-down sort of nanofabrication engineering project. Uh, I, I joke around with people and say that I got my PhD in fabrication, which sounds like something that a scientist is never supposed to do is fabricate, you know, something, but I was fabricating structures as opposed to data. How are you trying to generate an inclusive community in the classroom during COVID? I've been having hybrid office hours lately. So um, the last few times I had office hours, we sat outside and people that wanted to show up in person could come in person and we would sit at adjacent tables outside Yogurt World. And then the students who wanted to, uh, to Zoom in could Zoom in. Um, and one of the, at least one student from Nano 11 told me that I was the first faculty member that he's met, period. What aspects of remote work would you keep once life returns to normal? I think I would like to attend a lot more uh, like department meetings virtually. Um, I think that a Zoom office hour would be a good like supplement, like a supplemental office hour um, that would save everybody a lot of time, I think. Um, what I found though is that when multiple participants come to the Zoom session, they don't necessarily, I, I feel like there's more engagement in a, re, in a live office hour session. I feel like there's more of a, uh, of a uh, participation from everybody in the room. I think that it might take Somehow it like makes people more nervous to speak up on Zoom in some circumstances. It's like you're being broadcast. It's like, you know, your your face appears because your voice activated the, uh, you know, the thing. <laughs> and, uh, and everyone can see your name and everybody can see inside, you know, your room or your closet or wherever you are. It's a little bit more intimidating in some sense, which is odd, but I, I do get that impression. Did you develop any COVID hobbies? For a while, I doubled down on my piano playing at home and also also trying to find new ways, like creative ways to uh, get up and move. <laughs> because uh, with the Apple Watch, you get your active calorie count on it. And I always wanted to get to like 600 active calories per day. And that's pretty easy on campus if you're walking to your car and then you're walking to a couple meetings a day and walking to class and you don't even have to like set aside time to like exercise the active calories build up automatically but at home 
you know, you might net like 150 calories from maybe walking up and down the stairs a few times. So um, I've discovered a trail near my house. Uh, I knew it was there, but I'm going there a lot more often and like doing things like dictating problem sets to my phone <laughs> and uh, taking some some call some zoom calls uh, sort of on the road walking uh, I bought a weight machine to like try to do other stuff during the day like at home um, yeah because now I don't I can't even walk to my car and back are you working from home or remote? Uh, mostly work from home. I would say that I started coming in two to three times a week the last maybe three weeks ago, um, in part because I felt that the sense of community in my lab was being a little diminished by everybody being away. And I felt that my presence here could maybe serve as like support and like an anchor for the group. like. Uh, you know, I can do a, a walkthrough in the lab and have a quick chat with students just so that they know they're not like here alone and forgotten about and that what they do matters. You mentioned that you work while taking walks by dictating problem sets into your phone. How does that work? Uh, yeah, and then I, I'll change out the symbols when I have access to a keyboard. But most of the work that actually goes into composing a problem set is in the conceptual part. Like, what, what do I want to test? Why did you start the podcast? Build, oh yeah, the other COVID hobby, my other COVID hobby is my podcast. And I'm up to 37 episodes now. I started doing it in June. And a lot of times I'll come up with the questions on a walk and I'll dictate those into my phone. So it, yeah, it ends up being a jumbled mess, but at least it's there. What are your most successful podcast episodes? So actually my, my most successful episodes on average are just me talking about a particular topic like grant writing. I had an episode on mental health. I had an episode, a couple of episodes on like choosing a PI in graduate school, um, failure as a scientist or engineer. And so those, those have gotten probably the most, um, the most hits. I did have a couple of higher profile interviews. There's, a, um, there's an economist, uh, Tyler Cowen, who's kind of like a pretty famous public intellectual and author. He has like at least 10 books. He's a professor at George Mason University. Um, and I, had wanted to talk to him for a long time and I can't believe he said yes uh, and because he's famous for so many other things. Um, so we had a very fun discussion and the first 15 minutes of it were about Star Trek. So if, if, you, uh, if you're bored of that stuff, you can just skip ahead to about 15 minutes in when we get into other stuff. But I think you can understand the beginning of it without uh, even having seen Star Trek. What episodes do you have coming up? Oh, yes, coming up. Uh, yeah, well, because I'm teaching two classes right now and I have several grant deadlines due, um, I'm actually not going to record another one probably late March. Do you have any particular goals for the podcast? Um, any goals for the podcast, like getting a particular guest or reaching a certain number of listeners? Um, so the all the podcast content is mirrored on my YouTube channel. I now have 8,050 subscribers, which I'm pretty happy about. Um, I think the goal is like at like 10,000 subscribers. Um, they send you, YouTube sends you a plaque. <laughs> um, and then when you submit book proposals, they look at your social media following and are much more likely to give you like a book deal. And I've always wanted to write a popular science book. And I think the goal in terms of the YouTube and podcast audience is to grow that to the point where I would have a built-in audience to write like a book. Tell us about the book you want to write. The book is, has any, does anybody know who Anthony Bourdain was? Yeah, so he was the host of 
three to three to four different travel documentary TV shows over the last 15 years. He died about two years ago um, by suicide. And he wrote a book called Kitchen Confidential that made him very famous. And it was the it was a book intended for uh, it was a book intended for line cooks and chefs to read and laugh about because he was kind of making fun of the whole restaurant industry, even though he had been a chef for many years. But it was so well written and so funny and the the stories in it were so vivid that it took it it gained a life of its own and became very popular like it was a top bestseller in like 2000 2001 and uh and people outside of the restaurant industry just loved it and that's why he got all that like later success um I want to do the same thing. Oh, in, in between like the chapters that were about his like particular like stories about people that he met in his career in the food industry, um, he also taught the audience about like how the restaurant industry works, like what its margins are, why you should never order a anything with raw lettuce in it at a restaurant, <laughs> why, why you should... Um, uh, why you should never order the special because the special is all stuff that is about to go bad in the walk-in fridge and all that stuff. So um, I wanted to do the same thing about like academic research and write a book about people that I've met and uh, and situations that I've been in, entertaining stories that would appeal to people like you. So people in science and engineering in a university setting, but also have an instructive component that would teach the teach policymakers and journalists and other interested individuals just where all that money in the NIH budget goes. How does NSF work? How does PhD education work? And do it in a, uh, in a lively sort of funny way and, uh, and do for academic science what Anthony Bourdain did for the restaurant industry. What have you learned about being a professor that you didn't know before you started? I understand a lot more now about the job, obviously, as a professor than I did as a student. I had no idea what professors did outside of their classroom teaching. I sort of thought that they worked three hours a week and then they <laughs> didn't do anything <laughs> the rest of the time. I didn't, re I didn't even really realize that in grad school. Like I thought my, my, so I worked for a pretty famous professor as a PhD student and I knew he was busy, but it didn't really occur to me just how much money it took to have like 20 PhD students and 20 postdocs in the lab and how basically every action you took had to be oriented toward raising money for the group. To give you an example, this is something that could go in the book. It's, it's more on the instruction side than on the, uh, on the, like the humorous anecdote side. But if my lab expenditures are like $800,000 a year, then the amount of money that I have to generate per hour if I'm working a 40 hour week and professors work a weird schedule, so it's not really gonna be 40 hours, it's something else, something more than 40. And uh, it ends up being like 500 to $600 per hour. And if there's some meeting that I'm only invited to, to like speak for two minutes <laughs> and like, it's like I was in a meeting this morning for this um, particular like highfalutin invite, like invited speaker series. And I was the host of one of the speakers. All I was on the schedule to do was to uh, explain what my plans were for like the workshop. It took me 90 seconds to tell this committee, but I was obligated to be in the meeting for, for a full hour. That's a $500 opportunity cost that I was, I was not generating, that was not contributing to teaching, to mentorship, 
to research. Um, and I think that that is not well understood by people who are not living this life. It's not like I'm going to write a grant for $500 in one hour, but I could put that hour toward a grant that's, you know, or toward some philanthropic like proposal or toward teaching that is like part of my job. But as a professor, a lot of different like interests have legitimate demands on your time. And it's very hard to say no to some of these people, especially if like the dean is involved, that kind of thing. Is there an opportunity cost to speaking with us now? <laughs> See, but this is this is a different kind of activity because it's like, I mean, teaching and mentor mentorship and like this is this is like why I do this job, <laughs> like, uh, but it's, you know, it's not to meet in a meeting with 40 other people where I could have just said my piece in an email and it would have taken two seconds. <laughs> Engaging with students is like why I do this job. I like it more than, I actually like it more than the research part. And I don't think that many of my colleagues would say that. How did you know you wanted to go into academia? I think I got into it because, well, there are a few different reasons. One of which is that I wanted to be my own boss at as young an age as possible. So I started my job at uh, 29 and there aren't that many, like, you know, you start out as an assistant professor and you don't have tenure and you're expected to meet a certain, you know, get a certain number of publications and teach a certain number of classes. And then after six years, you know, you get tenure and they can't fire you. And then you have, you know, you can work three hours a week the rest of your life. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, it's a it's a difficult existence as like a start as a young professor, but you you don't really have a boss. Like they can fire you at the end of six years, like four to six years, depending on when you go up for tenure. Um, but you, and you have the department chair, maybe they can tell you what class you have to teach and they maybe have control over how much lab space you get. Um, but they can't, they're not going to tell you how much, how many students to hire. They're not going to tell you what grants to apply for. They're not going to tell you what hours you have to work. Um, you have a lot of control over your own schedule. And I think that the mental health challenges of having sort of constant deadlines and having to report to so many different people are counterbalanced by the personal freedoms that you do have. Like the joke is, yeah, as, as an assistant professor, you have lots of flexibility. You can work whatever 70 hours a week you want. <laughs> and, uh, and then Jerry Brown, the former governor of California, uh, said, that professors didn't need raises because they were doing what they love. <laughs> and uh, that didn't go so well, go over so well in the UC system with the, uh, with the, the faculty. Um, so you do have a lot of people that you have to like report to, but not a single one of them can like tell you what to do on a particular day. It's like, Chair, the chair has very limited power. The dean has very limited power, especially after you get tenure. And even your program managers at like NSF or NIH or the Department of Defense, or if you have a philanthropic donor or a corporate sponsor, like if you don't like working with them, you can just stop taking their money <laughs> and find another program within that agency or somebody else to start working with. So there's a lot of flexibility. Um, Although I probably have a more positive outlook than most uh, young-ish faculty that you are likely to chat with. But um, yeah, it's the best job for me, at least. Why did you enroll in the COVID vaccine trial? I wanted to do some kind of service for COVID because I was just sitting in my closet, you know, doing my job while frontline workers were putting their lives at risk. Um, even, you know, people in the grocery store were being breathed on, you know, every single day. Uh, hospital workers were, were, you know, just 
sort of swimming in COVID particles in intensive care units. And I didn't feel like I was doing enough. Also, my wife works for Hologic, which has a, a big chunk of the uh, U.S., uh, actually even the worldwide COVID uh, testing market. And I felt like I wasn't doing enough. Like my what I was doing, especially over the summer when I didn't have any like teaching, I was doing a lot of like working and like writing grants and papers and stuff, but I didn't have like the right, the steady flow of like, of, uh, of, of teaching, uh, like my teaching assignments, which generally like keep me grounded. Um, I felt like I needed to do something, um, that put some, something at risk. So I signed up, um, I filled out the questionnaire that the, the UCSD sent out sometime in I guess it was October, and um, I got lucky, I guess, in that they called me back, um, and I enrolled in the AstraZeneca trial. Um, I thought that there was something really interesting about being part of a uh, viral vector um, vaccine trial. Uh, it seemed like the mRNA vaccines were already kind of wrapping up their human trials at the time, and moreover, the AstraZeneca trial gave you a two to one chance that you would actually get the vaccine instead of the placebo, which is just a saltwater injection. Um, and there was some risk, like three people in the, in the trial had had a pretty severe neurological complication. Um, but after they shut down the trial for six weeks or something like that in the US, they uh, determined that they couldn't link it to the vaccine. So they, uh, they reopened it and uh yeah they they called me back and i um uh and i uh signed up and i did it um if you think about the 75,000 people in in america who got or who who or more like 150,000 people who were part of either the placebo arm or the vaccine arm for all of the different vaccines like pooled together, like well over 100 of them are, are dead that got the placebo. Um, so while they had the same background risk as everybody else, it's like just that, that flip of a coin, like they're dead, whereas everyone else that, that got the vaccine not a single one of them died, um, which is crazy. So if you look at the effectiveness, it's or the the um, the uh, the efficacy of some vaccines report seventy five percent, some report ninety percent, ninety five percent. You have to look at the endpoint, like where they started doing the testing, how many weeks after the vaccination, um, what their um, what their questionnaire looked like. Uh, whether they said how you know how many hours have you been experiencing these symptoms? Because they're not doing a nasal swab every time you go in; they're actually expecting the the participants to report symptoms, and then they give them the uh, the nasal pharyngeal swab. Yeah, so 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 everyone knows about like blinding, right? Like um, the reason why you do a, a double blind randomized control trial is to make sure that the vaccine arm and the control arm of the study are from the same exact like pool of participants, like same geographic region, same socioeconomic factors. You know, at least there would be almost like a like a matching between like people in the, you know, they take people of every different socioeconomic background, but they, they need to have like, it needs to be represented and then they randomize it. And not even the study uh, principal investigator knows who got what until the very end. Um, and the reason they do that is because you're comparing the number of people who got COVID in the vaccine arm to the number of people who got COVID in the control arm. And as soon as there are some number, like say there's like 95 people in the placebo arm that got it and five people in the vaccine arm, then you say it's 95% effective or you know however the math works out. Um, but that's just based on symptoms. So self-reported symptoms, it's not based on um, who actually tested positive for COVID. 
um, because asympt it doesn't catch asymptomatic people. What else do I want to say about that? Yeah, so I actually went through a little bit of a um, a little bit of a, a moral dilemma because I I wanted to know if I got the vaccine. So I had some like muscle and joint aches and like a headache, but you know there was a chance it could have been something else that I had or something I ate or something. So uh, I got a um, an an antibody test. Uh, at one of the ones at LabCorp that you can get just by paying with your credit card, like a direct-to-consumer test. And um, you have to get the right antibody test. You have to get the IgG test, the immunoglobulin G test, that specifically looks for the antibody against the, uh, against the spike protein. Because the a general antibody test might also have uh, look for, have antigens related to the nucleocapsid proteins in the interior of the virus, which the vaccine genes don't code for. So you have to get, there's like a matrix, two by two matrix, and three of those four matrices, like IgM and, like, and, uh, and nucleocapsid will not give you the information you want. So you have to do some digging to figure out what tests are actually testing for what. So I did test positive for the uh, the IgG spike antibody, so I know that I got it. Uh, and yeah, but I'm trying not to let it affect my behavior. I'm still double masking usually if I'm indoors and uh, I don't really see that many people. Uh, I'm definitely vaccinated. Um, as the AstraZeneca vaccine has been approved in 50 countries um, and it does not, I'm still waiting for the, the results from the US trial to be released. They have data from other countries and there's no reason to believe why they didn't, you know, why it's not, they shouldn't be pretty similar results. But other countries now have other variants of the virus. And probably over time, we will all have the same variants. Um, and now it's just a race between um, how fast people can get vaccinated um, and how quickly the variants emerge. Now the question is, if, I'm, if I become eligible for the uh, Moderna or Pfizer vaccine, would I get it? Um, and it depends on a few things. It depends on how good the AstraZeneca data were in the, in the US trial, and it depends on how soon they would, re they would contact me and it would, and it depends on whether I not whether or not I need like a vaccine passport in order to travel, because I haven't been on a plane in thirteen months, and I used to travel a hundred thousand miles a year, um, like twice a month at least, uh, and I'm not planning on going on any work trips, but it would be nice to see like my dad who's ninety, for example. How do you come up with proposal ideas, especially as a student, when you don't know much about the topic yet? You will probably just, out of necessity, end up having to come up with something that's close to what has been done. Um, but a, especially in, in engineering, where, where the goal is to like generate a function as opposed to figuring out how some mechanism works you have a lot more leeway to like say i wish we had something that pick some big like societal or environmental problem like some water purification membrane some new type of nanoparticle for mrna vaccines that don't need to be frozen um and then just make it up like use physical principles, use what you've learned, but you don't know if it's going to work. And proposals, we rarely know if it's going to work. Uh, that's why in academia we have freedom to take chances because, you know, we're training people as we go and it doesn't have to work. Like, even at my stage, I don't know, nine out of 10 ideas that I think of are, have either already been done or 
are totally not going to work and I just haven't talked to the right person. So it's still challenging, but at the end of the day, like as a student, you just, and even like as a professor, you just have to put one foot in front of the other and say, this is a problem I'm interested in. This is something I know the first thing about, and I'm just going to write down whatever I know about it and try to work toward it in as small steps as I can. How does your group come up with project ideas for graduate students? I usually come up with a general direction and then the grad students work on it and arrive at their own sort of solution to it. Um, it's pretty rare that I'll know like what will work. Um, and in some cases, a student comes in completely prepackaged with the idea and the methodology. And that's pretty rare just because of experience. Like I've been to more conferences, I've read more papers um, than they have. So what are the odds that they would know better than I do? <laughs> but um, sometimes it does happen, especially when somebody comes in knowing that they have a particular technique that they want to work on. And maybe I don't have a background in it and I haven't read those papers, but what I can do is um, teach them about research, like help th help guide them toward answering an important question. Um, I help them a lot with writing uh, and experimental design and, you know, use of the scientific method, I would say. What skills should engineering students try to pick up before starting their jobs? I think that engineering is a often a, a team sport <laughs> and being able to uh, work with people in a constructive way and build off of each other's experience and knowledge is a really important uh, part of being an engineer. There are jobs that are more like uh, oriented around the concept of an individual contributor, um, but I would say that some basic ways of structuring relationships with, uh, and even conversations with, uh, with coworkers, and uh, you can practice on classmates. <laughs> um, there, are, there are better and worse ways to work with people. And sometimes it's, it just ends up being like what comes out of your mouth. Like people have this idea that they're either naturally charismatic or they're not. Like, I'm just awkward. I can't be in this conversation. I don't know what to say. You always have a choice as to what comes out of your mouth. And you can, there are there are righter and r wronger ways to, to generate a mutually beneficial relationship that allows everybody to flourish on a team. I actually have a, vi have a video and a podcast episode on that called How to Win Friends and Influence People, which is, I got the title from the famous book from the 1930s uh, by Dale Carnegie. <laughs> Getting good work out of a team. What have you learned as a manager? How do you get good work out of a lab? Where everyone gets along, everybody sort of smart and firing on all cylinders is relatively easy. You just need to provide resources and support and the things that, you know, you're you're good at. That's why you were put in that managing management position. The difficult thing is when things go awry and when you have a conflict, you have a conflict between people in your organization to uh, to work out, or there's some something more nefarious, like somebody fabricated data, and what do you do with them? Or somebody is not like prepared, like for the work, and you thought they would be when you brought them on, but they're not. And how do you manage those situations? So I hate to say that experience is the uh, is the the answer to all of these problems. And it's, it's part of the answer, but I think you always want to try to learn what somebody wants to get out of a situation they put themselves into, like a job, um, a degree program, 
um, a conversation, a relationship, a project, and sometimes they don't know what the answer is. And sometimes people will ask you for things and they think that that will solve the problem, but it, but it won't. And sometimes if you know what the actual problem is, you might as a manager have a way of dealing with it that is not like, you know, this is what I want. I need this equipment or this day off, or I need to get this person off my back, or I need whatever. You have to acknowledge their problem, but you also need to figure out what the, what the problem really is and not just give them what they ask for right off the bat because they might not know that that's not the most effective thing that they could have that would solve their underlying problem. Is that a piano behind you? Yes, I bought a real piano, well, an acoustic piano uh, at home as my gift to myself when I got promoted to full professor, so I brought my digital piano to my office. I almost never play it, but I can if I want, so... I saw that my I had a, a colleague at MIT who um, had a, a piano in his office, and uh, I'm like, I should have a piano in my office too. Yeah, definitely, especially like if I have like a few minutes b between meetings or something, and I can't do anything else, and my inbox is like, I've already cleared all my emails out. <laughs> How did you become a fan of classic Star Trek? It was. October 10th, uh, 1993, and I know the day because um, it's, the, it's like the week we got our 486 computer, our IBM compatible computer, and so the date that was stamped on the BIOS and everything, every time you turned it on, like the first time the settings had been configured, was October 10th, uh, 1993. And uh, my sisters and I just wanted to play Solitaire on Windows 3.1, and I was kicked off because they needed their time on the new computer. And so I went to watch my local Fox affiliate, which uh, it was like 10 p.m. and they were playing original Star Trek episodes. And what showed up was Operation Annihilate, which is the episode where these flying fried eggs fly around and they inject these little tentacles into uh, into people and they make them go uh, go crazy and eventually these tentacles uh, kill them and one of these things landed on Mr. Spock and uh, and he was stunned and, and fell backwards and uh, and then there was a commercial break and I just felt like I really needed to see what happened next and of course I had I was 10 years old at the time so I had seen like some Star Trek, uh, but that was the time when I'm like, this is a really good show. And of course it was cheesy. And even then the show was already 35 years old and, uh, and it was cheesy then. And I'm just like, but there was some, something beloved about the cheesiness. So that's how I got into it. 